Easter has come and gone, and with it a multitude of religious passion plays, in which Judas' betrayal of Jesus is played out in front of an audience of the faithful. In my experience, this includes the ubiquitous 30 shekels of silver paid to Judas for his identification of Jesus with a kiss. But was the empire really so bad at keeping tabs on troublemakers that they needed an elaborate scheme to find him? What exactly did Judas betray, and can we know why he did it? Stay tuned for all of that and so much more. Welcome to Misquoting Jesus with Bart Ehrman, the only show where a six-time New York Times best-selling author and world-renowned Bible scholar uncovers the many fascinating, little-known facts about the New Testament, the historical Jesus, and the rise of Christianity. I'm your host, Megan Lewis. Let's begin. The name Judas has become a byword for a traitor, someone who sells you out for their own gain. The fact that Judas betrayed Jesus isn't really a matter of debate, but exactly what was it that he told the Roman authorities? Was Jesus truly that hard to find, or did the, the Gospels not give us the full picture? Before we get into that, Bart, good morning. How are you doing today? Yep, doing fine, thanks. I'm in my um, in my um, recording studio now, and I finally got the uh, AC unit to work. <laughs> So it's getting, getting warm out there. So I'm glad. <laughs> In fact, it's worried so well. I'm wearing a sweater. <laughs> no, it's uh, getting a bit toasty in Maryland as well, actually. Um, before we start, and this is a little bit of a random one, I wanted to ask what career path you'd have chosen if you hadn't gone with academia. Wow. Okay. Yeah, that's random because, uh, right. And it's a short answer. I have no clue. <laughs> I, I'll tell you, I had no interest in becoming an academic. Uh, like, you know, when you start thinking about like what you want to do with your life, I, you know, I guess I, I didn't think much about it. Till I was probably in high school and I thought, I didn't know what I thought. I'd be a businessman or something. I didn't know my, my dad was in business. And, um, but I, I really couldn't figure out what I wanted to do, you know? And I, I think when I went off to before, like when I was in, in high school, I was thinking, you know, I guess I'll still, maybe I'll sell real estate or maybe I'll be an insurance salesman, something about sales. Maybe I, don't, I really had no, no idea. Um, and I only got interested in academics. I, I was smart enough in high school, but I, you know, I didn't really kind of kill myself for it, <laughs> but I, um, but I, uh, in, uh, is only because I got so interested in the Bible and started passionately studying the Bible. And pretty soon I was like, all I was doing was studying and, you know, the Bible and theology and early Christian history and things like that, that I realized that I, I was pretty good at it. And I also um, just really, that was my passion. And so I snuck in through the back door of ac academia. I, you know, I've got a I've got a brother. I don't know if I've mentioned my brother on here before. My my brother is three years older than me, and he's an academic who, like, he started in eighth grade. Man, he was going to be an academic, <laughs> and, and he and he is, and always has been. And for me, it was it was just an accident, really. Well, thanks. Yeah. Amazing. I bought the insurance salesman doesn't have quite the same ring to it as part the New Testament scholar. <laughs> well, I don't know. I mean, it's a lot. It actually, it probably works better at cocktail parties. I mean, you do, you want <laughs> you want to you want to kill a conversation pretty quickly. <laughs> you know, actually tell somebody what you do if you're a New Testament person. It's like what? <laughs> and you know, they always act like they're you know, oh, that's very interesting. But they're saying, oh my God, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> Internally yeah. working on that. I, I wow. study Jesus. <laughs> you know what, what you want to say? <laughs> oh, amazing, yeah. amazing. Right. But, 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 before you get out, I mean, did, I mean, you know, you went into a really bizarre area. I mean, talk about New Testament being bizarre. I mean, a, a seriology, like <laughs> what? It, it's, a, it's a little on the esoteric lines. All through. High school, I kind of wavered between some kind of history. I did classics in high school and absolutely loved it or some kind of art. So I went once I graduated, I did two years in art school. Mm. Um, I loved it, absolutely loved it. And then was sitting in an introductory lecture with my sister. She was going around universities and working out where she wanted to apply to. And she came to a university that was next door, essentially, to the one I was attending. Uh, so I met up with her. We had lunch and then I went and, and sat through uh, kind of the pitches that the history department was giving and absolutely fell in love, applied to the university and transferred um, the following year. And that was an ancient history 
degree program. Mm -hmm. uh, I was planning on being a classicist, but my undergraduate dissertation advisor was the departmental Assyriologist. And he uh, gave me this fantastic spiel, essentially saying, all of the classics have been translated. There's not a whole lot that you could do, but we've got so many cuneiform texts that need someone to work on them. You could be one of those someones. I was like, yes, fantastic. Let's do this. Uh, so I did it and just kind of haven't stopped. Huh. Well, I mean, I would say you know, moving from classics to Assyriology isn't, you know, it's not that from an outsider's point of view, it's not like moving, moving from, you know, like neuropsychology to, <laughs> what, I mean, it's like, you know, it's this still like true. it's ancient stuff with languages. Yeah. But okay. You had that interest. Yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well always. Done. Wow. Love history. Okay. Wow. Okay. So talking about history, Judas Iscariot, can you tell us briefly who Judas Iscariot was and what his name means? Um, yeah, so uh, Judas Iscariot is uh, was one of the twelve disciples of Jesus. Jesus uh, chose twelve um, uh, men who apparently had been following him to be his inner circle. Um, he's called Judas Iscariot um, because his, his name, his first name, Jude or Judas, was a common name. Uh, and there has to be some way to differentiate him from other uh, other people with that name. So the name Jude and the name Judas is the same name, same name in in, uh, in Greek and Aramaic. So um, so he's called Judas Iscariot. Uh, Jesus has a brother named Jude, for example. And you don't want to confuse those two. So. Um, the issue is we don't know what Iscariot means. Uh, there are lots of theories about it, and it, uh, it has, you know, it, people usually think that it has, that there's some kind of etymological explanation for it. And so they take apart the name, they try and figure out Iscariot. It sounds like uh, the Latin Sicarii. Sicar uh, Sicarii were the uh, were these kind of revolutionaries in Israel who, um, they were called that from the Latin word for a dagger. They would, uh, they were kind of, they would go into large crowds and they would dagger some <laughs> administrator and then run off. And, and so they were called dagger men. And Sicarii Iscariot, Iscariot, maybe he's like he was a revolutionary who wanted to overthrow the Romans. Um, other people point out that uh, Iscariot uh, could be derived from a, a term that means something like redhead, <laughs> red hair, <laughs> and other people. So you have all these uh, you have all these possible explanations. The one that is um, probably most common, which I think is probably the least problematic is that it comes from a Hebrew term, ish keriot, which would mean man from Kerioth, a, a village named Kerioth. The problem is we don't know of a village at the time named Kerioth. <laughs> so so we don't, we don't know. But anyway, so he was one of the disciples. Um, and in all of our traditions, he uh, handed Jesus over to the authorities who wanted to arrest him. Uh, that that they they decided that he was a troublemaker and they wanted to take him out of the way. And so the, the Jewish authorities in Jerusalem made an arrangement with Judas to betray Jesus uh, to them, and he he sh he showed them where um, they could arrest him without the crowds around. So why do you think it's important to talk about Judas and his role in the New Testament? Well, um, he he doesn't show up a lot in the Gospels, but where he shows up, it's really quite critical because he's the one who handed Jesus over to the authorities. And so it's understood that he is the one who, you know, he's the one who betrayed Jesus, even though he was an insider. And so the the Gospel stories, all four of the Gospels, focus on the events surrounding Jesus' death and resurrection. In all four, of course, he has a public ministry, um, but the public ministry um, um, takes, it, you know, it takes a good chunk of the gospel. So in the Gospel of Mark, for example, the, the public ministry lasts about 10 chapters, but then the last week lasts the final six chapters. So six chapters for the final week and 10 chapters for everything else. In the Gospel of John, it's even more extreme because in John, it's clear Jesus' public ministry lasts three years or just about three years probably. Uh, but, you know, 
chapters, I mean, nine, nine of the chapters are uh, on the, of the 21 are on the last week. And so, so the last week is what really it's all driving toward. And the events of Jesus' death and then his resurrection are driven in by the fact that somebody turned him over to the authorities. Do the canonical gospels have significant differences in what they say about Judas? Yeah, there there are some there are a lot of similarities, um, probably because there there, there were widespread traditions that probably have some kind of historical root that, as I said, he was named Judas Iscariot. He was one of the 12. He betrayed Jesus and, and so forth. Um, but there are, there are differences, including, for example, why did he do it? Um, and, uh, you know, one gospel will say, well, he did it because he wanted the 30 pieces of silver. Another gospel will say, you know, the devil had come had come into him and, and made him do it. You know, in other words, say, well, he was a devil. <laughs> you know, and so so there are different different ways of explaining that. There are differences um, in uh, what happened after he betrayed uh, Jesus. Um, some some of these differences are actually contradictory uh, to each other, and some of the differences are just different. Can you give an example of one of the contradictions? Yeah, so the big one has to do with how Judas died. And so in um, so you have the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and his death is only recounted in one of them, the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, the other Gospels just leave him out of the picture. After he betrays Jesus, he's gone. No more reference to him. In Matthew, um, we're told that after uh, Judas' uh, betrayal, he, he hanged himself. Uh, so that doesn't contradict one of the Gospels, but it does contradict the other account of Judas's death in um, the book of Acts. In the book of Acts, chapter one, after Jesus' death and resurrection, uh, the disciples come together to talk about what to do now because one of their members has been lost. Judas is no longer with them uh, because he, he, he's died. And in the book of Acts, we're told that he died because he uh, fell uh, head first, and his um, and his intestines uh, burst on the ground and and bled all over the place, and that's how he died. So in one of them, he hangs himself, and the other somehow he falls and bursts open, <laughs> whatever that means. Interesting. Could you explain a little more about those differences? Yeah, so there are some interesting similarities between the two stories. I mean, I've given kind of a brief summary of how he dies, but the stories are interesting because of their similarities and their differences in relation to each other. So in Matthew's account, Matthew's the account where you told, we're told that he was given 30 pieces of silver to betray Jesus. And what happens is when he realizes how they were treating Jesus, he gets upset and he, um, he tries to return the money to the priests who have paid it to him and uh, they won't take it because, um, um, you know, they say, look, you know, we're not going to take it back. <laughs> and so he throws the money down in the temple precinct and and he goes out and hangs himself the priests take the money and they can't redeposit it in the temple treasury because it's been used to betray innocent blood and so it's blood money and so instead of putting it in the temple treasury they go out and they buy a field field with it in jerusalem as a burial field and it's called the field of blood because it was purchased with blood money Okay, so that's Matthew's account. And in, in Acts' account, you have a similar account to the extent that the death of Judas has something to do with a field of blood. But in this case, it's not that the priests have bought a field with blood money, so they call it the field of blood. In this case, what happens is Judas falls headlong and fills his intestines on the ground and bleeds all over it. And so... They called it the field of blood because Judas's blood was spilled on it. But he's the one who had bought the field. He bought the field with the money, and then he bled all over it, so it's called the field of blood. So uh, in both, you've got this field called the field of blood that's connected with Judas's death and something to do with his betrayal, but they're completely at odds with each other. In one, the priest buy it, and the other, Judas buys it. In one, it's filled with blood because of blood money, and the other, it's filled with blood because he bled on it. In one, he dies by hanging. The other, he dies by falling forward and, and bursting open. 
People, of course, tried to reconcile these things, but <laughs> this one's really hard to reconcile. No, no, that's definitely a tricky one. How how do you reconcile those two stories? Yeah, well, you have to do some really fancy footwork because, you know, if you ha if somebody hangs themselves by the neck, that's very different from falling down on a field and spilling your intestines out. So people have to come up with stuff and they make, they make stuff up. And so, for example, a common explanation, which makes no sense to me, <laughs> is that what happened is Judas was hanging himself, but the rope broke. And so when the rope broke, he fell headlong onto the ground and spilled his intestines out on it. And so that's the explanation. And man, I know a lot of people buy that. I mean, I know scholars. I had a debate with a scholar in England on the, like on the radio where he or there's a video of it where he argued that that's what happened. And I said, what? what? So like, it doesn't work. If, if somebody is cut down from a rope that they're hanging on, or if the rope breaks, they fall with their feet toward the ground. They don't fall head first. <laughs> you can't fall head first if the rope is broken. <laughs> you fall feet first. And so it doesn't work because in Acts, he falls head first. <laughs> and so, so anyway, you come up with something where you say, well, he was hanging and yeah, it didn't kill him. So what they did is they took him down and like they, you know, threw him off a cliff and he broke out his, you know, or whatever. I mean, you just make stuff up. But in fact, it's, it's, you, I don't. I don't think you can wreck something. And what I, I tell people, I tell my students, look, don't take my word for this. Just do a careful, write out what exactly happens in Matthew, then write out exactly what happens in in Acts and compare the two. I'm telling you, you can't reconcile these two. So a possible explanation for that may be held in the next question. Some scholars argue that there never was a Judas Iscariot and he was invented by Christians, which would explain why there are all these stories that mm. don't line up. Um, what are your thoughts on that view? Yeah, well, so it is a view and there's some logic to this view. And there are some scholars who have uh, advance this view. And it's it's one of these views that a lot of people find really attractive, uh, but I think I think is implausible. I think there, there must have been a Judas, but for reasons we can talk about. But but the, the argument tends to be that the name Judas is obviously related to the word Jew. And these accounts are highly anti-Jewish in their orientation. It's the Jewish leaders who have Jesus arrested. They're the ones who insist on his death. Uh, the Jewish crowd gathers together. Pilate asks them if they want them to release Jesus, and the Jewish crowd says no. And the Jewish crowd prefers a uh, an insurrectionist, Barabbas. Uh, and so, and so, it's all about how Jews are responsible for the death of Jesus. And the argument is, it's not an accident that the one who turns him over is Judas, and that's the argument. You know, I think it needs to be taken very seriously, but I think there are really compelling reasons for, for thinking that there was a Judas Iscariot and that he did he did something that led to Jesus' death. We'll be talking about what that was in a minute. But but so what I mean, there are several things. I'll, I'll point out a couple of things. One is what historians do when they're looking, trying to piece together something that happened in the past. They look at their sources. They see how many sources do we have that say something? Are the are these sources reliant on each other or are they independent? of each other. If you got a bunch of sources that all say it, then it's probably, you know, that's more likely something that happened. And in this particular case, you have stories about Judas that are, you have stories in John that are different from the ones in Matthew. And Matthew have some differences from Mark and Mark from Luke. And they're all different. And the book of Acts has stuff, has a story in it. And so the, there, you have stories about Judas independently attested in our tradition. And moreover, uh, the main thing that is said about him does not seem to be the sort of thing that somebody would make up if they wanted to tell a story about Jesus. People were telling stories about Jesus after his death. The Christian, his followers were telling stories, tend to tell the stories that they find to be useful for their views, for their purposes. And they don't make up things that make Jesus look bad or that, um, you know, that might cast a shadow on Jesus. They can, the things that make him look good and positive. The idea that you'd make up a story of one of Jesus' insiders betraying him is really kind of hard to put your mind around. I mean, Jesus had no more authority than that. 
<laughs> he couldn't even he couldn't even control the twelve, and so you know, surely Jesus was a man with you know charismatic authority, and so it doesn't seem like somebody would make that one up. So the fact that it's independently attested, and it seems unlikely for somebody to make it up, you could have made up some other story, some other person named Judas who wasn't even connected with the 12, you know, or, or you could make up something else. But it didn't seem likely to make that one. So that's, that's, that's one reason for thinking. Uh, those are two reasons for thinking that probably he's a historical figure. Thank you. I have questions as we go forward about the actual actions that Judas carries out. But before we get into that, I... I had a thought just occur to me as you were explaining about why some people think that Judas was invented. Etymological connections in ancient languages that also sound similar in English, so Judas, Jewish, can be a little tricky sometimes. Yeah. Is there an actual connection between those two words or is it that they just sound similar in English? I think that both of them go back to Judah as the uh, the tribe uh, that was in the southern part of Israel that then became a nation, the nation of Judah. And I think that Jew is somebody who lived in Judah. And then later in the New Testament times, it'd be Judea. Uh, the name got slightly changed to Judea. And that the name Judas probably refers to somebody who's, you know, just naming after the country. Thank you. So thinking now about what Jesus is recorded to have done, the Gospels describe how he identified Jesus for the authorities, which has always been a point of confusion for me. It doesn't seem that Jesus was particularly quiet or subtle or really interested at all in avoiding attention. So why did the authorities need Judas to point him out to them? Yeah, you know, I I just, I never thought about that for years, I'll have to admit. And, but you're absolutely right. I mean, he rides into town on the donkey with the acclamation of the crowds. He goes into the temple and he over, Jesus he goes, turns over tables and, and he like causes this big ruckus. And it's like, he's this, he's got all these crowds around him. What? Why do you need somebody to tell you where he's going to be? I mean, in the gospels, the point is that Judas tells them where they can find him when there aren't crowds around. but. You know, probably about 20 years ago, I started thinking, you know, maybe I'd watch too many detective movies or something. Why don't they just tail him? I mean, how hard can it be? Just, just you know, just follow, have somebody follow him and let you know where. And so I realized, you know, it doesn't really quite make sense. And actually, that's why I don't think what Judas betrayed was his whereabouts. I don't think that is what Judas did. I mean, he, he may have done that, but I don't think that's. I don't think that's really what's going on uh, historically. I don't think that's historically what happened. So that brings us really to the crux of this episode. If Judas wasn't employed to just point Jesus out to the authorities, what information could he have provided that would have led to Jesus' arrest? Yeah, I think that's the issue. I don't think that it's that he showed them where to arrest him. I think he gave them what they needed in order to arrest him. This is a kind of a long and complicated sequence of thinking. <laughs> There's kind of a, it's it's not simple, but I I'll put it in the simplest terms, uh, and then we can I can expound and explain it. In the simplest terms, I think Judas betrayed to the Jewish authorities what they needed in order to bring Jesus to the attention of the Romans. That he revealed what Jesus had been teaching that was not public knowledge that would, could be seen as a, uh, as a serious offense against the Romans. And I think what he told the Jewish authorities was that Jesus was calling himself the Messiah. And that wasn't publicly known, but th that once they learned that he was calling himself the Messiah, that's all they needed to have him arrested. Let me, before we get into the details of that, let me just say that a Messiah in that context, the term Messiah, as we've talked about on the podcast before, refers to the anointed one of Israel. Uh, the word Messiah comes from the Hebrew word Mashiach, which means anointed one, which is a reference to the king of Israel who was anointed during a coronation ceremony. There hadn't been a king in Israel for 600 years, but some Jews expected that God would bring a king 
who would liberate Israel from its oppressors and establish Israel as a sovereign state in the land, who would be a king, uh, so a political figure, but also a military figure who would overcome the enemy. So that a future Messiah would be this future uh, military leader who became a king. And I think that Judas betrayed to the authorities that Jesus was calling himself the future Messiah. Would that alone have been enough to warrant an arrest if there's no planning, no army, no military intent, which there doesn't seem to have been? Would that just the, the use of the term Messiah have been enough? Uh, yeah, I think so. I mean, um, especially in, in in Roman eyes. So the way the, the way the the way the sequence of things works in the Gospels, I think, is basically right. That Jewish authorities were worried about Jesus causing some kind of uprising, some kind of ruckus. He's starting to get crowds around him. He's preaching this message that God is soon going to intervene in history and destroy his enemies. And there's going to be a some kind of war that's going to take place. So that they want to get him out of the public eye because they don't want they don't want the crowds during this busy, busy, busy Passover time to start rallying around the idea that there's this future, very soon there's going to be some kind of divine event happens that involves a war. And so once they hear that he is the calling himself the future king, uh, this is something Romans, the Roman authorities would have been most concerned about. So the, do, do, uh, for people who don't understand quite the situation, the the uh, Jewish authorities in Jerusalem were local authorities who ran the civic affairs of of the city, but the Roman governor was in charge of of ordering the entire area, and he pretty much let the local authorities carry on with what they had to do. But the Roman the Roman governor was responsible for keeping peace, and so if there's any kind of uprising, the Romans are going to crack down on it. If you have somebody claiming to be a future king who says that a war is coming or that some kind of destruction is coming to God's enemies, and he claims to be the leader of the people who are going to be, you know, who are going to emerge as the rulers of this region. If he's calling himself king, that even without an army, that's enough for them just to nip it in the bud and get rid of the guy, which is what they do. So why do you think that Judas portrayed that Jesus was calling himself the Messiah? Yeah, as opposed to like, you know, where is he? <laughs> yeah. So there are lots of reasons for thinking this. This is not this is not a novelty with me. Uh, others have said this. I think probably I first read about this, and I think Albert Schweitzer had a similar view in his quest for the historical Jesus, that this is what Judas betrayed, even though that's not what the Gospels say. Uh, the Gospels you know, say he betrayed his whereabouts. But there are very good reasons for thinking that, in fact, he betrayed that Jesus was calling himself the future king. So, among other things, one has to ask, why is it that Jesus was crucified? Why did they crucify Jesus? And it has to do, it certainly has to do with something that he was saying, right? Or something saying or doing. They weren't just like picking people off the street and crucifying them. They, they had reasons for crucifying people. And so why why did they crucify Jesus? Well, in the accounts, in the accounts of Jesus' death, it's really quite clear. When when in all the accounts, when Pilate puts him on trial, he asks him, Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus either doesn't say anything, or he says yes, or he says maybe, or he says that's what you say, but he says something and he gets killed for calling himself the king of the Jews. And in the placard above his head on the cross, this is the king of the Jews. It's all about being king of the Jews. And there are very good reasons for thinking that this is not an explanation that later Christians made up for why Romans killed Jesus. One very good reason for thinking that this isn't like a Christian invention. Oh, yeah, well, they thought he was they said he was the king of the Jews, but he never said that is because this phrase king of the Jews is never a phrase that Christians used for Jesus in any of our writings. This strikes people as odd, but read through the, the New Testament. You don't have in the New Testament, in the Gospels, in Paul, they don't, they call Jesus lots of things. They call him uh, the Savior. They call him the Son of God. They call him the Son of Man. They call him all sorts of things. They call him the Lord. They don't call him King of the Jews. What does that show? 
it shows that they did not assign this label to Jesus. This wasn't how they imagined him. But that means they wouldn't have assigned the label to Jesus at his crucifixion. They would have called him, come up with something else. So he's killed for calling himself the king of the Jews. But, and in the Gospels, Jesus does not go around saying he's the king of the Jews. Look through all of the sermons in Matthew, or everything he says in Mark, or, or Luke. He doesn't, he, he doesn't talk about himself as the king of the Jews. Well, then why would that be the question at his trial? What, what, why that question? Why not, did you really go into the temple and turn over some tables? Or are you really a troublemaker? Or are you really this, that, or the other thing? Are you really causing trouble with the Sadducees and Pharisees? It's none of those questions. It's the questions pointed, are you the king of the Jews? The Roman authorities have heard that he's calling himself the king of the Jews. Well, he doesn't call himself that in public, ever. And it's not the sort of thing a Christian later would make up. They got the information from someone. So where'd they get it? Well, the hypothesis that Schweitzer had that I think is right is that to his own disciples, Jesus was explaining that the kingdom of God is coming and I'm going to be the king. I will be the future king. Jesus thought that he was the Messiah of the future kingdom. And one of the disciples who knew he was saying that told the authorities. What are your reasons for thinking that Jesus was teaching this information privately? Right. So he's not, he's never recorded saying it publicly. So why I think he actually taught this to the disciples. There are some, some passages in the New Testament that I think show clearly this is something he was teaching the disciples. And so with, with the sayings of Jesus, as we've seen repeatedly on this podcast, you have to figure out if this is a saying that Jesus really said, or if it's something that somebody put on his lips later that it wanted him to say. There's a saying of Jesus, I'm sure Jesus said, because I don't think anybody would have put it on his lips after his death. In, uh, in both Matthew and Luke, Jesus is talking to his uh, disciples, and he says to them, you 12 will be seated on 12 thrones, ruling the 12 tribes of Israel in the future kingdom. Okay, so when the kingdom comes, the, uh, the king's on the throne, you 12 will be ruling the 12 tribes. Why do I think this is something Jesus really said? It's because after Jesus' death, nobody would have made it up that way. Because everybody knew one of the 12 had betrayed Jesus. Judas is one of the 12. He betrayed Jesus. He's an outsider now. But Jesus is talking to the 12, including Judas. And he says, you 12 will be ruling. In other words, Judas will be one of the rulers. So you see, somebody later wouldn't make that up because they wouldn't want to imply that Judas would be one of the rulers, which means it probably went back to Jesus. If Jesus is telling the 12 that they'll be on 12 thrones, ruling 12 tribes, who's going to be ruling them? Well, he's the one who chose them. He's their leader. He's, he's, the, he's the one who's going to be the king. He's going to have the king, and he's going to have 12 rulers under him. And that's how Jesus was imagining would happen when the coming destruction came and God set up his kingdom. Judas knew that full well. He tells it to the authorities. Uh, the Jewish authorities tell it to the Roman authorities. And at the trial, Pilate asks him, are you the king of the Jews? <laughs> and Jesus says, yes, or maybe, or, but they end up crucifying him for it. So the million dollar impossible to answer question following all of that, if Judas is essentially being promised a throne in the future kingdom, he's going to be a king above one of the tribes. Why then does he turn on his leader? We can't know for certain, but what are some of the motives that have been ascribed to him? Yeah, well, we can't know for certain. You're right. I mean, we can't know. This is I I'm pretty I'm pretty sure he betrayed the information that Jesus was calling himself the future Messiah King. Why did he do it? There are a number of reasons that have been suggested. Uh, you'll find different ones in different Jesus movies <laughs> produced in Hollywood. Uh, and some of them are more, more plausible than others. Some think, for example, that Judas did think 
that there was going to be an imminent event that happened, but that he thought that it would be a kind of a military uprising, that, that Jesus would rouse the troops, that he would get people in Jerusalem all excited during this Passover, and they would band together and throw out the, the Romans who were there in town and then start a, a war against the Romans and overthrow the Romans, and there'd be a new. And so Judas wanted to get that thing going. And uh, he saw that Jesus wasn't doing anything much about it. He came into Jerusalem and he teaches some and he does a few things, but it doesn't, he doesn't rouse the troops. And so maybe Judas does it in order to force Jesus' hand that if Jesus gets arrested, he's going to have to call out for help. And maybe people will come to it and th there'll be an uprising then. So maybe that's one possibility. Another possibility is that Judas comes into town and is hoping for this kind of military coup and it doesn't it doesn't happen and Jesus isn't doing anything. He gets frustrated and he realizes that Jesus isn't about to do this and he gets ticked off. He says, you know, I'm devoting my life to the saints and you're not even trying to make it happen. And so out of frustration and anger, he turn he turns him over is another possibility. So, you know, those are, you know, so those are two of the options that are widely thrown out there. Other people say, look, he wanted the money. <laughs> he took the 30, took the 30 bucks. And so, uh, and so, so there, there are a variety of things. I don't think we have a good way to know what really was going on in his head, why, why he did this or what happened after he did it. What, if you had to choose one, which motive would you find most compelling? I think the most compelling would be that he, he came to realize that Jesus wasn't going to, he wasn't going to do anything to make it happen. And that the end that Jesus kept saying was coming soon, showed no signs of coming. And he finally just, he, he just came to think, you know, Jesus is not, his message actually isn't coming true. And he found it frustrating that Jesus was doing nothing in order to promote it other than just, you know, teaching and and that out of frustration, he turned him in. Do you think it's likely that he was expecting the crucifixion or some kind of execution as the outcome of his actions? You know, I don't know how, how much somebody like Judas, who would have grown up in rural Galilee, up who probably, probably like the other disciples and Jesus, may never have seen a Roman in their lives. Like there weren't Roman soldiers everywhere and probably knew nothing about the Roman system of justice or, you know, up there probably you know, may not have even ever seen a crucifixion or anything like it. And so I don't know, you know, when they when they arrive in Jerusalem, all they can do is goggle at these tall buildings like, oh, my God, what is this? And they're like they're, they're not used to this kind of this culture that they've been thrown into. So I don't know if he really understood what the implications would be. Um, and I don't know if the Jewish authorities, what, what their idea was, you know, they may have just thought, you know, we're just going to take this troublemaker out of, out of sight for a while and until things calm down after the Passover. I, I just don't, I don't know. But one thing led to the next and, it, you know, it was, you know, the next day that Jesus was hanging on a cross. We will wrap it up there, but thank you so much. And we'll be back momentarily with some news about upcoming events. I'm Bart Ehrman, and I'm happy to announce a new online course titled The Bible and the Quran, Comparing Their Historical Problems. The course will take place over two days and will consist of eight lectures. It'll happen on Saturday, May 4th and Sunday, May 5th. This is going to be an unusually exciting, interesting, and informative course. I don't think there's ever been anything like it. I'll be speaking about the historical problems that scholars have had in studying the Christian Bible, and a scholar of Islam, Javad Hashmi, will be addressing the same problems with respect to the Quran. Javad is an unusual scholar. He engages in historical criticism on the Muslim scriptures much as I do on the Christian Bible. Javad's currently finishing his PhD in Islamic studies at Harvard, where he specializes in Quranic studies, Islamic origins, the historical Muhammad, and the question of religion and violence, especially in relation to the Quran. For this course, we've chosen four critical areas of historical concern, and we'll discuss each of these areas in relationship to the Bible and the Quran. These are the four areas. First, getting back to the originals, knowing what the authors actually wrote. Can we know the original words of the New Testament? 
can we know the original words of the Quran? Two, the reliability of the accounts, the problem of contradictions and errors. How much history and how much story is in the New Testament and in the Quran? Number three, the quests for the historical Jesus and the historical Muhammad. How do we know what Jesus really said and did? How do we know what Muhammad really said and did? And four, scripture and violence. A history of hatred, intolerance, and violence is the Bible to blame. Is the Quran to blame? Javad and I will be taking turns giving our lectures. I'll discuss the topic with respect to the New Testament, then Javad on the Quran, and then we'll discuss the similarities and the differences we find. So there'll be four lectures a day, and each day will be followed by a live Q&A with those who attend. I've done a lot of controversial things before, but I'm not sure I've done one that's this important. And now I'd like to introduce Javad himself, so he can tell you what he's going to be talking about. Thank you so much, Bart. I'm super excited to be teaching this course with you. I think it's going to be something really quite special. It might be the first publicly available academic course that takes a comparative approach to Islamic origins. So if you're interested in that topic, this is the course for you. Uh, my part is going to consist of four lectures. In the first lecture, we'll be taking a look at the transmission history of the Quranic text, basically to ask ourselves, do we have with us today the original Quranic text, and does it really go back to the Prophet Muhammad? In lecture number two, we'll be looking at the content of the Quranic text, looking at certain influences or texts that the Quran interacts with and scholars think influence the Quranic stories and accounts. We'll also be asking ourselves whether we should take these stories and accounts to be historically and scientifically accurate, or do we think that there are certain mythical or legendary aspects to them, just as many biblical scholars think in regards to biblical stories. Um, in lecture three, we'll be shifting to the quest for the historical Muhammad, just like there's a quest for the historical Jesus. Um, did the Prophet Muhammad even exist? And if he did exist, what can we know about him? Can we trust the traditional Islamic sources? And what does the Quran, or what can the Quran tell us about the historical Muhammad? In lecture number four, we'll shift to the question of uh, scripture and violence. Uh, many people think Islam is inherently violent and link that all back to the Quran. So we'll be exploring that question in our final lecture. We'll round all this off with a discussion between Bart and I about whether or not we think faithful Christians and faithful Muslims uh, can engage with their text in an academically rigorous manner, in an academically honest manner. So that'll be a good discussion that we'll have. Uh, I'm super excited about this course. Like I said, it might even get banned in certain countries. We might get a fatwa on our head. Um, so make sure you sign up because this is going to be an interesting course. Thanks so much. Thanks, Javad. This is going to be a great course. I don't think it's ever been done before. It'll be interesting, not just to Christians and Muslims, but to anyone in our world that deals with either of the two largest religious traditions in the history of the human race. Pretty important stuff. Again, this will be on May 4th and 5th. Uh, in terms of pricing, uh, the regular price for the course will be $59.95, but we have an early bird pricing of $49.95. And if you buy the course, if you come to it, you'll be given lifetime access to the recording. To learn more and to register for the course, simply go to barturman.com slash Bible and Quran. Again, this will be an amazing course, and I hope you'll be able to come. This is Bart's Weekly Update, where we get to catch up on all the latest about Dr. Ehrman's book releases, speaking engagements, ehrmanblog.org happenings, and online course launches. Okay, we're back in. So, Bart, this weekend you're going to be recording uh, the Bible and the Quran. We've spoken very briefly about this before. Could you just remind us uh, what the most exciting part of this was going to be. Yeah, well, it's going to be exciting for me. And it's 
You know, I, for, I've spent most of my career talking about issues connected with the reliability of the New Testament. Do we actually have the original words? Are there contradictions and differences? How do we know about the historical Jesus? The, things like critical problems of the New Testament. And people have long asked me, well, what about other sacred books? You know, how about the, you know, the, the Torah? Or how about the, uh, the Quran? Or how about the Book of Mormon? Or whatever. And these are not areas of my expertise. And so this, this is going to be so interesting because I'm going to talk about these issues to explain what the situation is with the New Testament. And Javad uh, Hashmi, who's going to, the, uh, the the Islamic scholar, who's going to be joining me, will be talking about the same issues about the Quran. And so I won't be talking about the Quran. He won't be talking about the New Testament. We are both experts in our respective fields. But so I'll talk about one of these issues about my field. He'll talk about his, and then we'll talk together about them, and and compare notes. And so it's not going to be like I'm going to be trying to defend the New Testament. He's going to try and be defend the Quran, or I'm going to be attacking the Quran. It's really this is going to be historically based. And for anyone who's interested in either or both books, there there's you know uh, there's nothing like this. <laughs> I've never heard of anything like this. And so I think this is really something to to pay attention to. So I hope I hope people can come because they're going to be they're certainly going to be hearing things they don't know. And I'm going to be hearing things that I don't know because I, as I said, I'm not an expert in the Quran, but Javad is. And so I'm really, really excited about this. I think it's a really great opportunity. And we very occasionally on Digital Hammurabi get questions about well, why don't you discuss the Quran? The answer is because I'm not a Quran specialist. It would be yeah. very, very unethical of me to really say anything about it at all. So having the ability to listen to you both talk about your respective specialities and then uh, to ask questions, I think will be really, really valuable. Uh, if people are interested in that, tickets are still available. The recording will be this coming weekend, the 4th and the 5th of May, uh, starting at 12 p.m. Eastern on the 4th, 1 p.m. Eastern on the 5th. And the cost is $59.95. You can sign up at uh, bartoman.com forward slash Bible and Quran. And as ever, MJ podcast is the code to get you uh, a discount on that. And if you can't watch it live, it will be available. The recordings will be available to view afterwards as well. So I hope you can join us. It's going to be a lot of fun. And we are now going to go to a new segment, which is called Scholar Spotlight. So stay tuned. I hope you enjoy. Interested in the most influential scholars of the New Testament and early Christianity? In this segment, Bart shines a light on a scholar making waves in the world of biblical studies. It's time for Scholar Spotlight. And we are back. Now, Scholar Spotlight is a new one, as I said, for Bart to share an academic, a scholar that he thinks we should all be aware of uh, and considering their work. So Bart, take it away. Who are you recommending this week? Well, you know, there there are lots and lots of very fine scholars who work in my field, New Testament and early Christianity. And, you know, I know the I know the ones of my generation and the previous generations best because uh, they're the ones who produced the most work. Some of my contemporaries are absolutely stellar scholars. And I'll, ju I'll just mention one one now. His name is David Brackey. B-R-A-K-K-E. He teaches at Ohio State University. He's one of the top scholars of early Christianity, not just in the United States, but in the world. He has enormous range. He can go from the New Testament up through the fifth century or so. But but people who are, you know, lay folk who are interested in aspects of early Christianity would well benefit from a couple of his things on Gnosticism. So I know a lot of people are interested in Gnosticism, and I often get asked, you know, how can I find out more about Gnosticism? David, David has a book called Gnosticism. <laughs> Uh, maybe it's what is Gnosticism, and and it describes in terms that are academically responsible, but still accessible to interested readers, how to understand this very famous group uh, based on scholarship of the last say thirty or forty years. Many people think about the Gnostics in terms that we were all were saying back in the 1970s or so. And most scholars today realize that what we were saying back then isn't really quite right. <laughs> and so this would be an up-to-date account. David also has uh, some courses uh, for the great courses, 
one on Gnosticism uh, and one on Jesus and the Apocrypha. And one, actually, they asked him to um, to do a new course, uh, Introduction to the New Testament, <laughs> which is the course that I originally did. And it's very, pretty funny because David, David and I are friends. But um, uh, he they wanted a new one. And so they sell both of these, so you can get both of them. But um, his is great. <laughs> but the funny story, Megan, you'll probably appreciate this. <laughs> About a year ago, my wife, Sarah, who's a Shakespeare scholar, said, you know, I, I think I need to learn more about the New Testament. I think I'm going to get David Brackey's course from the Great Courses on the New Testament. <laughs> <laughs> what? <That's incredible. laughs> what am I, chopped liver? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so uh, David Brackey, B-R-A-K-K-E, uh, works on Gnosticism and uh, various other things. And people might want to, if they're interested in this kind of thing, he'd be a great, great resource for you. Thank you so much, Bart. Now, before we finish for the week, would you mind summarizing what we spoke about today? Yeah, we're talking about Judas Iscariot, and I, I try to argue there actually was a Judas Iscariot, which uh, I think is widely, widely accepted. But I also tried to uh, explain what it is I think Judas betrayed. When he betrayed Jesus, I don't think he just told the authorities where they could find him in private. I think that he actually revealed the information that they needed in order to make an arrest. And the information was something Jesus was not publicly pro proclaiming, but was talking, telling his disciples that he, in fact, understood himself to be the future Messiah, who would be the king of the uh, of the inbreaking kingdom of God. Thank you so much, Bart. Audience, thank you all for listening. I hope you enjoyed the show. If you did, please subscribe to the podcast and make sure you don't miss future episodes. Remember that you can use the code MJPODCAST for a discount on all of Bart's courses over at www.barterman.com. Misquoting Jesus will be back next week. Bart, what are we talking about next time? So next time we're getting into a more controversial issue. This week was fairly controversial, but the next one is really controversial. It's probably the one thing that I write about that most people disagree with. It has to do with what happened to the body of Jesus. Was he actually buried on the day of his crucifixion? I think the answer is no. And we're going to be talking about that next time. Thank you all and goodbye. This has been an episode of Misquoting Jesus with Bart Ehrman. We'll be back with a new episode next Tuesday, so please be sure to subscribe to our show for free on your favorite podcast listening app or on Bart Ehrman's YouTube channel so you don't miss out. From Bart Ehrman and myself, Megan Lewis, thank you for joining us.